Hi, everybody. Welcome to Healthcare Americana. I am your host, Christopher Havig, CEO and co-founder of Freedom HealthWorks. Healthcare Americana is a podcast for the 99% of people who get care in America. We're not clinicians or policymakers. We're patients and caregivers, executives and advocates who are fed up with the status quo. We have a desire to change it. This podcast brings listeners backstage at innovative organizations with innovative individuals across America that are putting patients first by delivering exceptional care to anyone and everyone. So often, there are other health factors that play into decisions from a care standpoint and how we live our everyday lives. Coming from, I guess, the official close of the coronavirus pandemic, there's a lot of different factors that that go into those people that were sick, those people that recovered. There's still a lot of things that we don't understand yet. And depending on who you choose to believe, uh, there's a lot of debate out there as well. But one thing that is a factor of everyday life is going to be weight challenges. People struggle with weight on a day-to-day basis, and that has a huge repercussion in not just our healthcare system, but in people's personal lives. So with us today is Cara Richardson-Whiteley, author, speaker, plus-size advisor at Fat Woman on the Mountain. Cara, welcome to Healthcare Americana. Thanks for helping us uh, wade into this issue that is very sensitive, yet very, very important for a lot of Americans out there. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much for having me. Now, we got to dive in. Uh, Yes, I said that the company is called Fat Woman on a Mountain. Uh, I'm sure there's a story behind it. In fact, I know there's a story behind it, and I want to hear that story. Absolutely. So um, the name of my company is because I've climbed Kilimanjaro three times. And most people, when they look at me, and I, I know you're just seeing a headshot of me right now, um, when you look at me, because I'm, I'm plus size and, you know, I always kind of hover around the 300 pound mark, um, they wouldn't think that, that I've climbed, you know, Africa's highest peak three times. And um, the stories of, of why I climbed, everybody asks, why would you do that? Um, the first climb was after a significant weight loss. Uh, I lost 120 pounds. I thought I was on top of the world. And so hiking was kind of my way, my entree into doing that. Um, about a year later, I had my first daughter. I put more than half of that weight back. And I thought very much that uh, if I just returned to the mountain, that everything would be okay again. It's almost like maybe maybe Kilimanjaro was the reason I was able to drop all that weight. And so... Spoiler alert, that second climb wasn't was definitely not my best performance. I did have to turn around just shy of the summit so that I could make sure that I uh, returned safely. Um, but the third climb, because I, I thought I had given up hiking at that point, I came back so embarrassed, so full of shame, so just desperate for some kind of answer about why you know why I never fit into the eat less, move more model that everybody, you know, just said was, you know, it's just eat less, move more. And, and the magazine said, lose 10 pounds in a week and all these other things. And how come I was never able to, uh, live out those promises. Right. Um, and so the third climb I did as a plus size adventurer and my promise to myself was that I would stop looking at myself like a before and after picture because I realized that so many of the things in my life were waiting for weight. You know, I, I would get these adventure travel catalogs in the mail and, that had beautiful pictures of Machu Picchu, Kilimanjaro and the Alps. And I'd say to myself, I'll do that when I lose weight. But what I remembered was the outdoors. It wasn't so much about conquering the mountain as it was about experiencing nature. And experiencing nature was all about bringing experiences in, being present. And when I had a complicated relationship with food, especially um, after a sexual assault, after my parents divorced, a lot of trauma as a kid, binging and eating too much was like all about pushing away. So nature was about pulling it in. So when I decided to climb Kilimanjaro that third time, the promise that I made to myself that I would love myself where I was and go from there. Didn't matter if I lost a single pound. It didn't matter if, um, you know, it didn't matter where I landed on the mountain. What mattered is that I took powerful steps into nature and in the direction of the things that I wanted to do. And I captured that in my book, Gorge, um, My Journey Up Kilimanjaro at 300 Pounds. This is a book that is being made into a movie with This Is Us actress Chrissy Metz producing and starring as me. 
And I share that story and I share my experience very widely because I think that, especially in healthcare, there's this vision of what somebody who's plus sized is all about. Almost like you see their story before you see the human. And and that isn't always the case. It's an astonishing story because you know you see somebody who you say, wow, 300 pounds, that person's going to be having incredible mobility issues. Um, but yet you're able to overcome that. And, you know, you mentioned 67%, you know, of, of you know, well, let me, let me just go with this. And, and, and I want to attack it this way. You know, what you just said from a, a standpoint of, well, people just see somebody there and they think, wow, what that person can't, can't control themselves. They have no self control, very kind of, um, a kind of an insulting view already. Talk us through a little bit about how brands view that and give us a little insight into your work dealing with brands and saying, okay, this is, there are better ways to approach it uh, when you talk to this demographic. Right. Um, in fact, you know, I've been working with brands such as L.O. Bean and um, Keen, and I've done presentations at Uber, Google, Pfizer, Novo Nordisk. Um, the reason why I do that is and why I work with them is to help them better connect with people who may be struggling or don't feel seen or, you know, have an obstacle in the way of their path of, you know, where they want to be and what they want to be doing. Um My focus is really about bringing joy into life and instead of punishing about the weight. And I, I know that is completely contrary to what a lot of people in healthcare have thought. And what I feel is it's incredibly healing to be able to take steps to the things that make you feel joy. And, and you're right. You know, I I did a keynote presentation yesterday for elite women in travel. Right. And the question was, wasn't it harder to climb Kilimanjaro because you were heavier? And the answer is yes, of course it was. It's like carrying a child up the mountain, right? Um, But that doesn't mean it's worth doing. That doesn't mean that I shouldn't have the equipment to start doing the things that I enjoy doing, to be outside, to be active. And in the more than, oh my gosh, 16 years since I first climbed the mountain, right? Um, There's been such change in the amount of gear and equipment that's available out there for people to get active and to be outdoors. And there's been a tremendous shift in the outdoors community in showcasing just people of different body sizes, also diversity, um, ableism, things like that. Um, in a way, that, I'm sorry, ability, uh, in a way that is welcoming more people to the outdoors. And the pandemic certainly helped that because I know for sure, because I, I spent part of the pandemic hiking a hundred miles of the long trail, the trail that goes from the base of uh, Vermont all the way to the Canadian border. And, um, you know, nature saved me during the pandemic and it, and it sure did save a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. And you know, I, I always felt for the people who are stuck in their downtown studio apartments, 800 square feet and lock the doors of the apartment. I'm like, oh my God, how did you keep your sanity there? Um, I mentioned the number 67%. You know, if two thirds of women in the US, you know, size 12 and above, if looking from a business standpoint, that would make sense if I'm a retailer or if I'm a manufacturer say, you know what, we need to get that. We need to engage them. And if I'm an outdoor and fitness retailer, it's like, okay, how do we get these people? Um, there's a huge market market segment. I don't want to be crass about that and just talk about the dollars and cents when, you know, there's real health implications there. So it, it makes sense that a lot of companies are looking at that market thinking, you know, how do we, how do we utilize this? How do we, how do we enable them? Um, not just buy our stuff, but like you said, get out and experience nature, get out there and, and be more active and not, uh, not just confined to the four walls of their house. Well, think about a mall. Think about, you know, a shopping mall, traditional shopping mall in a shopping mall before it used to be that there was just one or two plus size stores there. That's it It, out of the whole mall. So that means two thirds of your audience is just walking right by walking right by, we're not even showing up because, you know, plenty of, um, extended people who wear extended sizes have had such negative experiences with a retailer who, um, profess that they had plus sizes. You get all excited. You go to the mall, you have been there in a while, and then you show up and you're like, Oh, that's only available online. 
and, you know, just to shift the conversation to healthcare, think about, you know, if you are a marketer in healthcare, is, are you only using plus size people for, you know, lose weight advertisements or diabetes um, materials? How do your, um, how your waiting rooms look? Do you have arms on the chair? I mean, when I was in, um, you know, I mentioned before that I binged. And so I was diagnosed with a bin, um, binge eating disorder, which is the most common, often very, very um, not, excuse me, binge eating disorder is the most common eating disorder out there. It's, it's three times, I'm sorry, it, uh, yeah, let's start again. Binge eating disorder is the most common eating disorder out there. There are as many people with binge eating disorder as three times of bulimia and anorexia combined. And yet, you know, when I went to the place um, in the city for treatment, I went to a waiting room and like I had to stand because there weren't chairs that accommodated me. Sometimes there was a love seat, but oftentimes there would be like a mom and a daughter sitting there together because, you know, of course, going to eating disorder treatment is hard. And so, so, you know, a younger kid would want to sit there. So like I had nowhere to sit and the same, I had the same experience just recently at a physician's office. And he specifically said that he doesn't normally do surgery on people who are BMI of 40 and above. And here I was getting treatment from the same guy. And it was really kind of off putting to be like, well, I need help. You know, why are you not helping me? I'm not asking you to do surgery on me. But it just is a very off-putting scenario. Yeah, I, I could totally imagine there. Talking with Cara Richardson Whiteley, um, author, speaker, plus size advisor, fat woman on the mountain. Cara, what do you say to the people who say, you know, this this kind of modern movement into, you know, loving your body no matter what size it is, you know, it's kind of normalizing significant health risks. What do you say to those people? Yeah, it's a it's a good conversation to have because. Um, you know, just because someone is saying being comfortable and being out there and doing what you love doesn't mean that you shouldn't take care of yourself, right? And, you know, there's certain things that you should do to nourish your body, get movement in. I think the movement, the movement in my view is about eradicating that shame that like people who are in larger bodies, which again, two thirds of, of women don't deserve to take up space, don't deserve to be, you know, on a hiking trail, in a swimsuit, all those other things. But again, that doesn't mean, you know, when I get comments about how you're glorifying obesity, no, that's not the case. That's not the case. And actually, and we can get into this later, I just learned this year that it's not necessarily obesity that's my issue. I actually have a condition called lipedema which went undiagnosed for three, four decades of my life. And so it's often misdiagnosed as obesity. So I have on my medical chart, morbid obesity, but I just learned that actually most of my weight is caused by um, a soft uh, connective tissue disorder called lipedema. And I just started surgeries to start to remove it. So again, it's not it's not always what you see. It's, you know, there's more to people's stories than what they look like. And um, the challenge, the challenge is, and I think what people are speaking up about is in the healthcare world, somebody who's in a larger body is often dismissed. You know, um, someone comes in with a sore throat and they, you know, they get, they get a, a talking to about their weight. I mean, in my case, I, I mean, I'm in the top 10% of Peloton users, right? <laughs> I mean, I've, I've climbed some of the highest mountains and yet I still carry all this weight around. I went for a COVID test once just because I came back from travel and I wanted to be sure that I didn't bring back anything with me and they weighed me. Like, why? Why was that necessary? That, why, that, that wasn't even needed. At the time, I just am like, I just want to make sure that I'm not going to give anybody a little souvenir that they didn't ask for. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I can totally understand, you know, special, special circumstances. But, you know, two thirds, you know, of women, they're not all going to have different conditions that hey, this is this is nature, this is chemical, I, I, I can't do anything about this, right? What do you say to, you know, on the medical provider standpoint that says, 
you know, instead of dismissing somebody who needs your help, right? I think we all agree that, hey, I'm going to go to my primary care doctor. I'm ready to make a change. How do I do this? And then you say like, wow, your experience have been completely negative. What is your advice to anybody in the medical profession that says, hey, if you want your patients to be compliant and say, okay, you know, maybe the way it is just based on calories, let's just call it just a pure kind of example there. How, how do they, how do they help that person in the best way possible? I think the most important place to start is to focus on the behavior, not the weight. And I know that's a little bit contradictory, but you know, if someone is moving all the time and they are, um, you know, they're, they're in a good place socially, mentally, and, and, and physically, because I mean, honestly, every time I go to the doctors, I get, I, I get my annual checkup every year. My numbers on the inside are picture perfect. They could not be better. You know, blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar, everything, textbook, even when I was pregnant, never had gestational diabetes, anything. So if you're focusing on the behavior and not necessarily the weight, I think that's a really good place to start. Where I started to be concerned, like as when I was a new mom, was that I my eating was out of control. Like I would pro- make myself these promises and then I couldn't keep them. Food and all the things that were going on in my mind, it was like an obsession. And what I really found out is, of course, this is an eating disorder. This is an eating disorder that needs treatment and it needs that focus on behavior versus calories in, calories out. And so start to look at those things. Are there other factors? So there was a point in my time when in my lifetime, when I lost 120 pounds, right? I lost one pant size, one pant size in 120 pounds. Like, is there an indication that something else is going on here? Do you have a patient who has diabetes? And no matter what you tell them, no matter what nutritional support you're giving them, they can't seem to follow the pattern that you're asking them to follow. Well, there's probably something else going on there. And it's not just about giving a lecture as it is giving support. Same goes with somebody who might be having some real sleep issues. You know, are they, you know, eating to, to try to fall asleep. So there's, you know, night eating syndrome, which is part of binge eating disorder. You know, are they, um, saying to themselves, they can't fall asleep until they eat this amount of food or, um, are they waking up in the middle of the night and eating? There's so many different things that could be going on. If you just see a little bit beyond the weight and not always have that be the focus, because if it's always on the focus of the weight and not the actual person and the holistic view, then you're going to start pushing people away. I mean, I I have a good number of people in this community who have stopped going to the doctor entirely. And that's not what you want because, you know, if there is a condition that's developing aside from their weight, you want to catch that early. Everybody in healthcare knows that it's easier to treat something once you catch something early. And if somebody is not going to the doctor simply because they keep having negative experience after negative experience where, you know, you know, people who, are in larger bodies are often seen like 28% of the time compared to somebody who's in a normal size body. So that's how Cara, quickly it's dismissed. Yeah. I, I want to, I want to explore that thread a little bit there, Cara. Um, you know, in our model from a freedom health work standpoint, we are big advocates of 45, 60 minute visits face to face time with the physician. Is this a conversation? Well, let me, let me ask you a different way here. Um, <clears throat> You decide to go see a doctor, right? We're going to do kind of a little role-playing kind of a scenario here. Um, You go see a doctor. What does your ideal visit look like for somebody who's struggling with weight? Hmm. That's a good question. So this would be somebody who is going in because they're concerned. Someone decided to go in and say, all right, I'm going to go see a doctor because I don't feel well or it's the right thing to do. Like everybody should go see a doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, no, nobody's invincible, right? Yeah, that's true. And that's true. instead of instead of the doctor saying, "Well, you just need to lose weight, and all your problems are going to go away," how does that ideal visit go for you in your mind? How long is it? Give us kind of like your your picture perfect primary care visit from a from a weight uh, loss standpoint. Great, um, that's a good question. It's it's really about again, it's more about this understanding the behavior, and I think that. 
when someone is talking about change and what they need to do to take the next steps to further, for their weight or for their well being, really, you know, um, and I've done the same, you know, with, with my knees, you know, I've, uh, my knees have struggled over the years because of course I've carried extra weight. And so what I, what I want a physician to do is to ask me about all the things that are going on about stress, about family life, about what kind of work are you doing? How are you feeling? Is there anything that's going on other than this, you know, um, to have circumstances changed in your life? How do you want them to change? Because um, a physician might have a different idea of wellness. I, I mean, it, it might have a different goal in mind than the patient. So as long as they're on the same page and they're taking that time to talk it through, because this is a big deal. This is people's bodies. And, you know, try to as, ascertain, is there, is there something else going on here that is far, far beyond um eat less, move more, you know, uh, is it, is it an eating disorder? Is there something going on with, you know, the metabolics? Is there, you know, is there another condition like lipedema? I mean, there are so many other options instead of this like, um, blank, you know, diagnosis of like, yeah, you just got to lose 40 pounds and you'll be fine. Right. Right. And the reason why I asked that, you know, I'm curious because I don't think anybody would argue that you know, being overweight, you know, obesity is a major problem for Americans. I mean, you know, it is from a nutrition standpoint, you know, like you said, different conditions underlying it. And, and, and I'm really curious because now you're introducing, you know what, this isn't just a surface issue, right? There's something going on beneath the surface, more of an addiction. Um, you know, is this an addiction? Is there, are there conditions or what is happening here? And it goes into, kind of a broader general sense of not say mental health, but you know, something along those veins is, is kind of what's occurring to me as we, as we have this conversation. And, and frankly, I think our medical industry has abandoned pretty much any, any ties or any responsibilities to that other than just going in and smacking somebody with a stick over the head and saying, thou shalt do this. If you don't do this, then you're non-compliant and you're out of here. I mean, there's got to be something <laughs> where somebody could open their eyes and be like, oh, wow, that's not working. Um, you know, the trends are going worse and worse. We're sliding. Maybe maybe we can do something different here. So that was the impetus of asking that question. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing is that maybe somebody just needs nutritional support. Maybe, you know, and it, let's say they have a pattern of stress eating. Well, then maybe you want to help connect them to a dietitian who has experience with eating disorders. Maybe they're not officially diagnosed with a, an eating disorder, but there are plenty of people out there who will give people support in a non judgmental way. Like, are they eating? nutrient dense foods are they you know are there ways that they can um learn time i mean for me when i was struggling with binge eating disorder so many things were just had nothing to do with food it was time management I, and i know that doesn't maybe to somebody who just studies the science of a body right <laughs> you know just knows this calorie equation right it doesn't make sense but to me, as somebody who is living in just perpetual, I mean, just being consumed by my relationship with food, right? It was really hard for me to get proper sleep because I had a new baby at home. And I learned later that sleep deprivation is my one of my biggest triggers. As a new mom, one of my biggest triggers was financial instability, you know, you could go deeper, like, you know, like, I'll tell you that, like, when my parents were divorced, I was the one who had to ask my dad, who was kind of explosive for the child support check. And so I hate financial insecurity. And I hate, you know, I hated that time when I wasn't, you know, as a maternity leave, I wasn't making much money, I felt really powerless. And so there were all these other things going on. And so for me to get a handle on my binge behaviors, I had to learn these skills. I had to work with mental health professionals. And there's so many buckets and skills that I had to learn um, that had nothing to do with weight. And so that's why um, oftentimes this conversation of like, well, you just got to lose 30 pounds and then come back to me. Or, you know, I realized that um, 
I realized that if I was going to get knee replacement surgery, which is, you know, in the cards for me at some point, I can't, I won't, insurance won't improve it unless my BMI is less than 40. So now I'm in this like self-fulfilling prophecy where I can't move as much as I want to, right? And, and I can't maintain my weight because my knees hurt so bad. And like, you know, and then, and then my knees hurt so bad and I can't do the things that I love. And now maybe my eating takes a nosedive, you know, so there's all these, all these cyclical things that start to happen and need to be addressed and thought about when someone is under your care. I guess that's the biggest question, right? How do you break that cycle? And, you know, you mentioned earlier, this is not, it's not immediate rewards, this takes time. It takes discipline. You know, losing 120 pounds and losing uh, one pant size, it's like that that weighs heavy, I'm sure, on you saying like, what, what in the world? Why is why am I not seeing the actual physical results based in here? But understanding the back of your mind, hey, there's a lot of different things that are happening here. Um, I want to talk real quick and kind of kind of bring this conversation home. You found nature. And found nature was like, wow, there's a lot of things that I've been missing out on. Give us some uh, some of your favorite moments from from climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. I mean, that's a bucket list for anybody out there. Give us some of, uh, you know, what you enjoy about it? What you love about it? And why'd you go back twice? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, Kilimanjaro is like climbing the side of the globe, right? So you start at the equator and you end at glaciers. And so, you know, your outdoor retailer is going to love that you popped in because you're going to need every piece of gear they've got to offer, right? From the, the, the warmest jackets to the coolest shorts. So um, it's an amazing experience. It's, uh, I've always done the wrong guy route, which is five and a half days up, one and a half days down, all without a shower. So not for everybody. <laughs> um, but my, I'd say my favorite moment of, of Kilimanjaro is summit night because summit night is about 15 hours of climbing and um, you start at about midnight. And so this is four and four days after you've been hiking as much as 10 hours a day or five hours a day up the steep inclines. But summit night is 15 hours of nonstop movement. And um, you start in the middle of the night. There's a couple of logistical reasons for that. You know, the scree is uh, usually a little more solid. The winds typically are lower. But when you open your tent door, there are stars um, above you, there's stars beside you, and there's stars below you. That's how high you're starting from. And it's a beautiful, wonderful experience. Also, you know, you should win some kind of adulting award that you've put every piece of gear on you. You look a little bit like the Michelin man because <laughs> you can't put your arms down. But, you know, you start walking up the mountain in this like lockstep formation. You know, it's the, the guides and the porters are singing Swahili love songs. Um, and it's amazing for the first hour, maybe the second but by the third hour, you're questioning a lot of life choices like, why am I not the kind of person who takes a beach vacation? How come I'm making this choice to be on this mountain and I like paid good money for this when you swear by the fourth hour that the porters and guides are completely lost? Because unlike hiking in my home state of Vermont and, and here in New Jersey, um, you know, there's not a lot of like trailblazes to show you that you're going the right way. And so you trudge through the dark. You just are so mad at everything, right? Every bad thought goes through your mind. But when the sun rises, you reach Gilman's Point and you can see the landscape illuminated below you. And you can see that every twist and turn, everything made sense. Everything that you went through, every hard part of this mountain, it was all meant to be. And yet here you are at the top. And you can experience it because you were willing to do the hard work. And really, that's where I feel like when it comes to, you know, working with the extended sizes audience, the plus size folks out there, that it's worth it. It's hard work. It's hard to kind of change the mindset of, you know, how we're dealing with people's health, how we're seeing a human being and how we're talking to them. But, you know, once you get through all those pitfalls, those moments where you take a step and you slide back. But when you get to the top, it's pretty epic to see how you can be, uh, you know, um, someone of change in your industry, in your life, and and mostly in your patient's life. Cara, uh, that was a beautiful visualization there. I think you just transported all of us uh, to Africa. So I, I do appreciate that. Last question for you. Anybody hearing that says, wow, you know, I'm just not in good enough shape to do that. I need to lose a couple pounds. 
What's your last word of advice for them? Well, um, you should take some steps right now. Just go somewhere. It doesn't have to be Kilimanjaro. Not everybody should climb Kilimanjaro. There's, there's so many ways to experience nature, so many accessible trails, so many places to just get started. For me, it was, you know, the 50 Hikes of New Jersey book. I just started with the easy ones, went to the moderate, then, you know, the more strenuous and difficult ones. And, and that's how it all started for me. And hiking is not for everybody either. Just move your body in a way that brings you joy and brings you closer to the life that you love. Cara Richardson, Whiteley, author, speaker, plus size advisor, fat woman of the mountain enterprises. Thank you so much for joining us here on Healthcare Americana. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. That's going to do it for this episode of Healthcare Americana. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to us, to this show on your favorite podcast platform. Check us out online, healthcareamericana.com. Catch previous episodes, subscribe to our mailing list, and visit our fantastic online store. Once again, I am your host, Christopher Habig. Thanks for listening.